now we'll get into a little bit of an overview about the hardware. For those of you who are somewhat familiar with our detectors, our technologies, you may have heard of the word scanning electron microscope, and uh, certainly EDAX has a series of detectors and cameras. What really, what, what are they? I break it down into really simple, two easy terms that will describe everything that we do. We use a signal source and then we use a series of signal detectors. In the world of analytical chemistry, everything comes from being able to differentiate signal from noise. The better that you do it, the better result that you have. So we use electron microscopes as our signal source. They use an electron beam that's focused down the column of the SEM, and then that electron beam interacts with the sample. With the sample, we get several different types of signal that we detect. Our SDD detectors, or our EDS detectors, detect X-ray excitation. That's an excitation event where the electron beam hits the sample with high force and generates an excitation event, which is an X-ray. With our EDS detectors, we analyze the energy of that X-ray. With our WDS de detectors, we analyze the wavelength of that energy. That's the result of the electron beam to sample interaction. Now, EBSD is a little bit different. We look at the electron backscatter diffraction. So the electron beam goes into the sample, doesn't create an X-ray excitation event, but rather interacts or diffracts with a material, a crystalline material with lattice planes, and gives you a signal that we then detect on our EBSD detectors or cameras. So many of you are familiar with the tools that we have in the app lab. And this is a view of a scanning electron microscope and several EDAX components. And the column of the SEM is the uh, large part in the center that's coming down. The electron beam starts at the top, gets focused down that column through a series of lenses, and then interacts with the sample that's behind the chamber. And our detectors are off to one side or the other. Our Trident system, which is our top of the line system that most of the very high end customers around the world are using to solve all of their microanalysis uh, technique needs. And that, that consists of our EDS SDD detector, our WDS detector for our wavelength, and our electron backscatter diffraction camera. And now we get to go inside of the SEM chamber. So this is, we open the door and we look inside what's going on here. We've heard of X-ray excitation and X-ray events. So as the electrons come down the column, they interact with the sample and the sample is on a stub. Once the electron beam excites the sample, uses enough energy to excite X-rays within the sample, those X-rays then go everywhere, literally everywhere inside the chamber. And the key is that we need to detect those X-rays as efficiently as possible. What we do is we take our detectors and we design them so that they could get in as close as possible to the sample so that they could maximize the collection of the X-rays that are generated. And these are all various terms that as we look at our detector designs, we make sure we optimize for things like distance or intersection distance to the uh, pole piece electron um, uh, elevation angle of the x-ray path. And these are all factors that go into building a maximized collection efficiency. When we think of collection efficiency, there are two terms uh, that are most important. They come together to create another term called solid angle. So we think of size and distance to the sample. Those create solid angle. And that equation is a function of the distance squared. So for EDAX, we not just focus on the size, but we spend extra time engineering our detectors so that we could get in as close as possible to the sample. And that gives us an even greater benefit than just the larger size. Further, we then take things after we collect them at the SDD chip and our electronics allow us to convert those x-rays into an electronic signal that's then displayed as a spectrum. How well we do that is defined as the accuracy. So that electronic conversion and putting the uh, peak where the peak is supposed to be 
is uh, very important. Being able to resolve the peak or use an energy resolution to separate out peaks that are close together gives us better analytical benefit. Stability, how well we're able to maintain all of that accuracy during all of the range of count rates, even at the very high count rates. And reproducibility, how we're able to do that over and over consistently. And these are all strengths that go into the EDAX detector as we design it, as well as when we apply it to collect data from our samples. The next one is the EBSD camera. And with the EBSD camera, we use the electron beam from the microscope to interact with a material that has lattice planes. The interaction of the electron between the lattice planes, if you will, think of a bouncy ball that goes between planes. They come off and are uh, diffracted onto the phosphor screen of the EBSD camera. And really one of the most interesting things about EBSD analysis is really just the geometry of the sample inside the chamber. So this is where we have our electron uh, pole piece our sample, our EDS detector, and our EBSD camera, all very close in together. The closer that we get the EBSD camera in, the better, our, the, uh, the better that we maximize the solid angle or the intensity that we get on the phosphor screen, and the faster we're able to collect. And finally, our WDS systems. So with WDS, we're also using the electron beam as our signal source. That then interacts with the sample, creating a series or a sphere of x-rays that uh, leave the sample and are picked up from our focusing optics. Our focusing optics get in even closer than the other two technologies to maximize the collection and focus the x-rays through a parallel beam. The parallel beam is a technology that is relatively new in the WDS world. Traditional WDS spectrometers have been around for decades, but it's only been the last decade or two that we're figuring out how to focus x-rays. With the introduction of that technology, we've been able to apply that to WDS technology, and nowadays all new detector WDS designs are moving towards that new parallel beam because it gives us maximum collection efficiency. So with those detectors, what does all that mean? Our customers are doing analyses. They're collecting data from their samples to be able to solve their problems. And they're using our detectors to do so. So now it's important that we bring this detector technology into real world life. With our Octane series of detectors, we focus on the speed, which we also translate into productivity. So we've increased the range of the silicon drift detector electronics and the collection. At the same time, we've kept the resolution stable. So even as your productivity on the x-axis increases, your resolution stays the same. It's kind of like running your car at 150 miles an hour, but still getting good fuel efficiency, not losing that performance. And that's what makes up the Octane series of detectors. And what people who are using EDS technology do is collect their data. When I first started at EDEX about 18 years ago, we were collecting for about 100 seconds per spectrum collection. That was just the way things were done then. Over the years, things have changed, and we sped up our analysis. Nowadays, we're working at very high output count rates. So we're pushing the limits. And when we use our faster processing time for our detector electronics, specifically our octane electronics, we're able to get low dead time or low lost time. And so the spectrum that you see here was collected at high output. And the next one is low output. A comparison of the two shows that at high output, you get more data for your work. So in the light blue outline, you see more data within your spectrum peaks so that you could collect more statistics, more data, and to solve your problems. To put that another way, we could increase our productivity. So if you have a high count rate, it means that you could collect faster. So at 30 seconds collection, we're just working at a low output count rate. And it takes a while to get the spectra. So 30 seconds to get the spectra. And the intensity of the peak is going to stay the same or, or nearly the same when we go up to five seconds. So now we increase our count rate and we speed up the collection time. We could get the same amount of data in just five seconds. 
but why stop there? If we go to 100,000 counts per second input and 70,000 counts per output or 67,000 counts per second output, we could collect for only two seconds. So this is where SDD technology has taken us. We could speed up the productivity of our work, get our analysis done more quickly, and not have any compromise in the data. And finally, keeping the resolution stable. This is important to us, so as we increase the count rate, speed up the collection time, how does our resolution change? And to illustrate resolution, we could look at some of the small or fine peaks. Those, uh, the, the tall sulfur peak there is separated with the sulfur K-beta peak, which is a beautiful separation there. As we speed up our productivity, we lose, say, one EV in count rate, and we barely lose anything in that peak resolution. So all the while, even as we're speeding up, the peak resolution stays the same, and we get no compromise in resolution. And to tie all those factors in together, we look at how we perform. So now we look at the output count rate and the performance. Now we're really doing an analysis. And this is an analysis of pyrite, which is iron sulfide, or FES2. And the key point is that there is one iron atom for every two sulfur atoms, creating the compound FES2. And if we look at the quantitative results that our EDAX team standardless quantitative data have given us, we see a really spot on result, 66 to 33, a clear two to one with a very low error percent. And as, for, as far as what iron sulfide is or what pyrite is, that's what a few of you have on your desks there. So we have everyday common materials and minerals, and we're looking at iron sulfide. Of course, if it was real gold, maybe it'll look the same, but we'd certainly get a different set of peaks. And there's yet another mineral that we could look at that has a slightly different change, and this is where now we have zinc substituting in, and it's called fellerite. And now the atomic ratios are about 50-50, where 50% sulfur and 50% the remainder of the other items. Again, we get an excellent error percentage, uh, very low error. And this is at 80,000 counts per second output with only one second collection time. So we're getting these phenomenal results in a quick collection time. It means our users can collect quickly, increase their productivity, make their managers happy by getting their reports done quickly, but all at the same time assuring quality data. In the end, it's the results that matter. And now we'll start thinking more in terms of microstructure. So the atoms that we saw, the weight percent, the atomic percent, show the composition that we get with our EDS data. And so our spectrum gives us our number, our composition, how much of the different elements we've got in our material. EBSD now looks at the crystal structure. So you have a certain amount of atoms that we saw. Now we arrange those atoms into a particular microstructure. And this is where each of the, the red dots that we see here would be atoms representing a unit cell or a crystal structure. And so while we get very good results, this is what we just saw a moment ago, so very low error percentage at the high uh, collection speeds. Now we do it at 70 degree tilt. And this is where we saw, remember the uh, chamber had the 70 degree tilt on your uh, SEM chamber, EBSD camera, and really close. So all of that geometrical consideration allows us to still maintain the quality of the data collection, even as we're doing integrated microanalysis. And so now our performance has no compromise based on the collection of EDS and EBSD together. And when we look at EBSD, like I said, we look at the microstructure or the arrangement of those atoms together. So with the 50-50 arrangement, let's just for simplicity's sake, we say it's one-to-one. -one. And then we arrange those atoms one-to-one. -one. And we get an EBSD or microstructure. And this is a pattern that represents the reflecting planes of those arrangements of those atoms. And we do that with our pyrite or FES2. And slightly different here, where we have two sulfur atoms to one iron atom. Nonetheless, we get a structural arrangement. And if you have a close eye, you'll be able to see that the structure looks similar to the one that you saw before. And in fact, the band pattern it even is nearly identical to the one that we saw before. And this is an excellent 
application for integrated analysis because the chemistry is different, but our structure is nearly the same. With integrated collection, we're able to side by side collect our EDS data, our spectrum, and our EBSD band pattern, all with one click. And the software is set up so that the workflow allows you to both collect your image and then collect your data. But even further, especially for our longtime EDS users, we're able to optimize our EBSD collection conditions based on our EDS goals. So most of our users these days are EDS users converting to integrated or EBSD technology. The more that we could relate our technologies, the better that it is for them to be able to easily understand new technologies. And this shows how we optimize our camera now for our EDS, uh, based on our EDS count. Another thing that we do is we use our EDS chemistry as the basis for the structure. So much like the slides that you saw before where we had the arrangement of the iron and the sulfur atoms together, now the software is smart that it collects those peaks and applies them towards a database, which then gives the microstructure that we solve a band pattern for. And in the end, we do that across a wide area or field of view to see our chemistry distribution, iron and our zinc, or more realistically, our compounds, so our pyrite, FES2, and our sphalerite, ZNS. And so now the colors that you see here are those combinations of elements together. And EBSD goes one step further, and it shows what the microstructure and the orientation is. This is very important because, for example, we see that one of the phases, twins, shows those bands, while the other phase does not. So altogether with EDS and EBSD combined, you're able to take structures that have ne nearly similar band patterns and use EDS to differentiate what peak or what point belongs to which phase. Now moving along to WDS. So with all of that capability, why would we need WDS? And WDS is taking the EDS analysis even further. So in areas where we have overlapping peaks, so larger, broader resolution, we're able to get finer analysis and better resolved peaks. Those better resolution peaks give the better ability to detect low limits of detection because they're separating out the counts where they belong to the elements that they belong to, better accuracy and improved results. And we could do that for many common overlaps one of the uh, very common ones that we see is lead sulfur. And you see here in the red EDS spectrum, it's a broad group of peaks, but the WDS is able to fine tune the resolution and separate out all of the underlying peaks. And we do that for several different materials. Finally, all of that data is used to solve our industry uh, applications. So customers have a wide variety of uses for their EDS, EBSD and WDS systems. And here we show some examples of those. So EDS detector collection efficiency is very important when we have biological materials because it's inherently low signal. So we want to maximize the collection. And in this example, we have a blade of sawgrass. You know, the ones where the, along the side of the grass you have the uh, spiky areas. So when we magnify that underneath the SEM beam, we're able to see those spiky areas, and then we use our EDS detector to find out the chemistry of the edges of the blade of sawgrass. Uh, organic materials are generally composed of carbon and oxygen, nitrogen, and in this case, we found something else. So there's silicon, and the silicon falls along those spiky outer edges of the sawgrass. So next time you're walking along a field and you get the sawgrass along the side of you, literally those are silicon dioxide, otherwise known as glass. So be careful with the sawgrass. Another example that our customers are using to solve their problems is phase mapping to get a compound analysis for their materials. Most materials are made of several different components together, and we get spectral analysis that allows us to see what the chemistry is, say magnesium oxide, or uh, a calcium sulfate. Varieties of different compound and complexities have many different spectrum peaks. 
for the analyst to be able to sort through and figure out what all those compounds are becomes very difficult, especially when you have many different compounds in a material. And the example that's shown here is a brake pad. Brake pad, as it turns out, is a, a mix of a variety of substances, both for uh, friction and uh, reduced heat. And those compounds come together to provide the material's properties. In this case, we look at some compounds that are uh, colored in the bright orange, as well as some of the compounds that are purple. And those all indicate different chemical compounds, as we see here in the key. That allows our users to classify what area fraction or what content of the polymer might be, what content of the barium sulfate might be in their brake pad. We're also doing some really neat things by combining full quantitative analysis and the strength of those quantitative composition numbers and apply it towards mapping. With mapping, we're able to see the distribution of an element in a field of view. With quant mapping, we're able to see a different view of that distribution. In some cases, low X energy x-rays get lost or absorbed in a material. And this is challenging because we want to maximize that lost signal. So what we do is we do an atomic percent map. And even if a low energy element is present along with a high energy element, we're still able to pull it out based on the fact that the atomic percent can be even higher than the atomic percent of the heavier element. So in this case, specifically, barium is the high atomic number or high weight percent. And it would get most of the representation in the weight percent map. But when we look at the atomic percent map, we see those particulates that in the previous map were these orange ones. Now we could see the oxygen from those particulates to better solve where the oxygen falls in the sample. And then we use WDS to even fine tune some of those differences. So we have this big mass of uh, different elements within the material. The compound is a great number of different elements. And some of them create challenging overlaps. In the case here where you see several peaks, one right after the other, WDS is actually able to fine tune the analysis to look at each of those peaks. And in the center peak there, the zirconium, as it turns out, you have two separate peaks. And WDS is both able to solve those two separate peaks, as well as confirm that it's zirconium and not one of the other potential overlapping elements like platinum or phosphorus. With EBSD, we have a range of materials applications. So this is a microelectronics device. Or uh, think of your, your cell phone or your computer. We don't like those to fail. We like them to have a long lifetime. And as it turns out, the microstructure is related to the lifetime of a microelectronic device. Something with a strong texture, meaning that all the crystals within the material are pointing in the same or similar direction. So let's say we have a stack of boxes. If they're all stacked up, that makes a nice micro texture. If we had the same amount of boxes and we threw them in a corner, they'd be all in disarray. And it wouldn't be as stable, our microelectronic device would fail more quickly if we have that disarray in our microstructure. And we use our EBSD tools to both visualize the microstructure as well as provide quantitative analysis, things like grain size diameter and the difference between the two, as well as the microtexture or the lining up of the orientations. And so that's an example of electronics. But we also use EBSD for mechanical understanding or, or physical changes. So in this example, which is similar to our recent blog post on our EDAX blog, we look at the microstructure of a pediatric heart stent. And in this case, it's several millimeters long, so something that we could look at with our eyes. And we look at various areas of the microstructure along that device. Now you could imagine in the area that it's bent, and this is where I'm talking about that physical component to it, so we're mechanically bending it. And in the area of the bend, Obviously, those crystal structure, that crystal structure is changing. Something is going on because we're mechanically forcing a change. And so the bent region that you see here has slip planes in them, or uh, compression twins. And so you see on the left-hand side in our orientation map, those twins are apparent both in the 
inner uh, edge and the outer edge. And we even do what we call local orientation maps to give us a distributional view of how that orientation changes. In the non-bent region, we see a nice strong uh, crystal structure without those uh, twins in there and without uh, local deformation. And finally, a very valuable application of EBSD is getting people who are doing different technologies to understand the benefit of EBSD. So X-ray diffraction has been around for decades, where EBSD is a newer and up-and-coming technique, and some people are just starting to get familiar with EBSD. When we relate to XRD or X-ray diffraction, the longtime XRD users are able to understand the difference in the meaning to EBSD. So while the XRD data between these two different areas in a sample would be the same, you could use EBSD to understand the spatial distribution. So there's an equal amount of red and blue in that map as there is in that map. Same amount of red, same amount of blue. But the distribution is different. So the red clumps up in the one on the left, and the red is more finely distributed in the one on the right. Now we're pushing the technology even further, understanding new markets, understanding new applications of the technology, and moving into transmission EBSD. So we'll just cover a few slides here. Traditional EBSD, interact, the electron beam interacts with the sample and comes immediately off into the EBSD camera with our band pattern. And we get nice EBSD orientation results. And this is showing the various step sizes or the spatial steps between sampling points. And we go down to, say, 10 nanometer step size, and we could get nice data. With transmission EBSD, we open up a new world where we're using the electron beam to pass through the material. So a thin sample now, the electron beam being transmitted through, and the diffraction being transmitted through, and coming out the other side and being detected by the EBSD camera. All we need is a little bit different sample preparation. We need a thin sample. We need a sample holder and just a little bit of extra time and sometimes luck getting our patterns through the material. And this is where it's a, a new technology. Sample prep is nowadays using the uh, focused ion beam and lift out capability where we mill away a sample, dig out our sample if we will, and make it very thin by uh, milling it away. In this case, we start with a bulk material, create a lift out, put that left lift out on the holder, and then we orient it under the beam. This example here is kind of shown for scale. So this here is really, in reality, a very tiny screw. So this, that, that screw there. And the sample is actually right there on the end. So you can imagine how small the sample is and the patience that it takes to create it. But once you do, we have a great benefit to the data that we could get out of it. And now, looking at eight nanometer steps. So in the previous slide where we looked at the uh, traditional EBSD, we went down to 10 nanometer steps. Now we're going even finer or smaller spatial steps. And we're still getting the grain structure. And even further, we go down higher magnification, finer step size to collect data from even smaller areas and understanding differences between even smaller microstructure. A comparison between traditional EBSD and transmission EBSD shows that we get finer resolution with transmission EBSD, but there is effect uh, based on the thickness of the sample. And so our applications engineers around the world are continuing to explore applications for transmission EBSD. Finally, we've got 3D microanalysis. And this is an area where we're spending additional effort into product exploration, product launches even, and giving more solutions to our customers who are doing this type of work. To do a quick summary of what 3D is, we're looking at a bulk material. So we start with a bulk material, which is a, a sample, a, a block of uh, metal, if you will. And we collect our data from that first field of view. We then pull away material. So we analyze the first field of view. We take or mill sample away and characterize our next field of view. We take more material away from the surface of the sample. And we keep doing that. At each 
field of view, we're collecting data, and in the end, you get a data set that shows the depth of what's going on underneath the surface of your sample. And so that all requires a very specific geometrical arrangement between electron beam and the ion beam that's used to mill away the sample or cut away the sample. We use our team software to be able to uh, identify our scan area, set our parameters, and optimize our camera. And then we do that over and over again. And the example that you see on the upper left-hand side is uh, the fib view. So that's where it's actually cutting into the sample. So that's the sample that you see there with various thickness uh, layers removed. We get a composition at each of them. And so these are our different elemental maps. And of course, we create a phase map or combination of different elements together. We do the same thing with each slice for EBSD, too. So now we're not just getting the composition, but we're getting the microstructure or the orientation. And we do that over and over and over and over and over again. We do it many times, and we come up with a data set that shows the microstructure in an arrangement with both surface analysis area as well as depth analysis. And we're able to cut through the material and view the data that we've collected at each of the points for our EDS data. And as you're seeing variations in the intensity, that means it's variations in the concentration. So high cobalt areas, low cobalt areas. And we're also able to do this with EBSD, where we get the orientation or the grain information and with our software visualization, we're able to look at the grain arrangement underneath the surface. So this, as you would imagine, gives a user much more information to work with to truly understand what their material is doing and how to characterize it. We go even further by being able to extract data from the data set and view all that independently. And this is one of the growing areas of the technology, as well as one of the growing areas for our product line. Something really engaging for us to look through for now and the future. So to bring it all together, what we do is we create our technologies to detect a signal. We use our software to optimize the collection. And we deliver the results and the analysis so that our customers could solve they are solutions to their materials characterization needs. Thank you.